Welcome to the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery webinar series. My name is Ken Hale. I am one of the associate directors in the Higher Education Center, and we are excited that so many of you were able to join us for today's informative program by Dr. Molly Downing. The title of her presentation is Beyond the Basics, the Pharmacology of Commonly Misused Prescription Drugs. Dr. Downing will introduce a few questions throughout the webinar to poll our listening audience. She will introduce each question and the polling feature will appear on the right side panel. You will have a few seconds to respond after which the survey results will be shared. We will also have time for questions at the conclusion of the program. You can submit questions using the chat function on the right side panel and I will pose them to Dr. Downing. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery. Our mission is to help colleges and universities develop, implement, and evaluate programs and policies to reduce problems experienced by students due to alcohol and other drug misuse. The center was reestablished at The Ohio State University in 2014 thanks to a grant from the Conrad Hilton Foundation. We are, all, we are an interdisciplinary center with strong partnerships between the College of Pharmacy, College of Work, Office of Student Life, the Generation RX Initiative, and the Collegiate Recovery Community. The Higher Education Center provides a number of services and support for colleges and universities relating to technical assistance, technology development, education and training, and research and development. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Molly Downing. Dr. Downing is a clinical instructor at the Ohio State University College of Pharmacy and a key contributor to the Generation RX initiative to promote safe medication practices. She received her PhD in pharmacology at Vanderbilt University before completing postdoctoral training in science education at Ohio State. Dr. Downing, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you, Ken, for that introduction. So I'd like to start today's webinar by reviewing our objectives. By the end of this webinar, participants will be able to explain how commonly misused prescription drugs work in the brain to produce euphoric effects, dependency, and addiction, identify factors that increase the addiction potential of a drug, and discuss the current approaches to treat opioid addiction or rescue an opioid overdose. The outline for today's webinar includes the following six topics. So we'll begin by discussing the pharmacology of commonly misused prescription drugs, and then we're going to specifically focus on prescription opioids to discuss the remaining topics. So as many of you know, the three categories of commonly misused prescription drugs include prescription opioid pain relievers, sedatives, and stimulants. Examples of opioid pain relievers include Oxycontin and Vicodin, and they're often prescribed for pain relief. Prescription sedatives include Valium and Xanax, and these medications are often prescribed to relieve anxiety or even induce sleep. And lastly, prescription stimulants include Adderall and Ritalin, and these medications are often prescribed to improve focus and concentration. And many times individuals misuse these products to experience similar pharmacological effects that we just mentioned. So today I'm going to define misuse as taking a medication differently than instructed by a healthcare professional, and that includes sharing or taking someone else's medication. So we'll first discuss how these categories of prescription drugs elicit these pharmacological effects. And then we'll discuss how their pharmacology uh, may also mediate effects of euphoria, dependency, and possibly addiction. Okay, so to start, what is pharmacology? Well, we define pharmacology as the study of how drugs work. Um, and it's really based on the principle that drugs do not create new functions, but instead they modify existing functions in the body. So if we look at the figure on the right, 
there's a picture of a, of a cell, that's the gray circle you see, and it's expressing a target, okay? So in this case, the target is the protein called a receptor, and those are the pink circles um, expressed on the cell. Now, our body makes specific chemicals that can bind and interact with this receptor, and that results in telling the cell to do something, all right? So drugs simply modify this function. And in fact, we can um, design or discover drugs that act just like these natural chemicals interacting with specific targets to elicit the same cellular response. So now let's consider the pharmacology of that first category of commonly misused prescription drugs, prescription opioid pain relievers. So the target prescription opioid pain relievers binds um, in the body is called the mu opioid receptor. So for example, in the picture on the right, the purple protein expressed in the cell membrane um, is the mu opioid receptor. Okay, so our body makes neuropeptides, um, and those are represented by the blue shapes in this diagram labeled the endogenous ligand. And you can see that those neuropeptides can bind and they can activate that mu opioid receptor, and that results in an effect or a cellular response, uh, which is pain relief. So this is kind of the normal function. So how do prescription opioid pain relievers work? Well, they modify the process by also activating the same opioid receptor. So now we're looking at the same figure um, on the right, but there's a few additional panels. So if we focus on the top panel first, now there are some green circle shapes and those are representative of our prescription opioid pain reliever. It has a similar shape to the natural chemical our body makes so it too can activate the opioid receptor. And in fact, in pharmacology, we would call that type of drug an agonist. So if you focus now on the bottom right panel, now we have the natural uh, peptide that our body makes, and we have the opioid prescription drug, both are present, and both can activate that mu opioid receptor, and together they increase the cumulative effect. So an individual taking a prescription opioid with thus experience increased pain relief. However, we know that the mu opioid receptor is expressed in various areas of the body. And so um, this process can also produce side effects such as nausea or drowsiness. All right, so that was how prescription opioids work. Now let's talk about prescription sedatives. So the target for prescription sedatives is another receptor. Um, it's actually called the GABA-A receptor, but it functions as an ion channel, okay? So the figure on the right depicts how ion channels function. So these are proteins expressed in the cell membrane. Um, they're represented by the purple shape in this figure. And just like the name suggests, they actually create a channel or a pore in the membrane that allows for the flux of selective ions from outside to inside the cell. So in this figure, the ions are represented by the green circles. In ion channels, they often open in response to a specific signal. So in the, in the case of the GABA-A receptor, the signal is the chemical GABA. Um, that's represented by the orange circle in the figure. And GABA is a chemical released by specific cells in our brain. So when GABA binds the ion channel, it opens. And in the case of this channel, chloride ions flow through and they enter the cell. The, in this particular situation, the cellular response elicited is inhibition of brain activity. Okay, so GABA, when it binds its receptor, that results in kind of central nervous system depression or an inhibition of brain activity. So how do prescription sedatives work? Well, they actually enhance the actions of GABA. Okay, so they also combine that same GABA-A receptor. So if we look at the picture on the right, now the receptor is represented by the um, kind of pink protein in the cell membrane. And you can see that it actually identifies a specific site where GABA binds. But if you look closely, it also indicates a separate site called the benzodiazepine binding site. 
And this is actually a site where many of the prescription sedatives bind. So benzodiazepines, they're actually a class of drugs categorized as prescription sedatives. So the prescription sedative would bind at that site. And when it binds, it actually enhances the binding of GABA to the receptor. So what happens? Well, more ion channels were open, allowing more chloride ions to flow through and enter the cell. And as a result, that cellular response is increased, and thus there's increased inhibition of the brain. Okay, so a patient actually would experience that enhanced inhibition um, as perhaps anxiety relief, sedation, um, an overall calming effect, or even induction of sleep. But again, that's the same process based upon where the receptor is expressed um, can maybe mediate some undesired effects like disorientation. Okay, so our last category of um, commonly misused prescription drugs were our prescription stimulants. So let's consider how they work. So prescription stimulants, they actually modify a different type of target, um, a target that functions as a transporter. And they actually can modify two different transporters. The dopamine reuptake transporter, which is labeled DAT in the figure on the right, or the norepinephrine reuptake transporter, which is labeled NET. So both transporters are represented kind of by the same shape. It's that blue protein that has an arrow going through it and the figure on the right. So if we look at this figure, cells in our brain or the neurons in our brain, they release chemicals to mediate signaling or communication between two neurons. So dopamine and norepinephrine um, are examples of these chemicals and they're represented by the orange circles and this figure. So upon release from a neuron, they can bind their respective receptor on a neighboring neuron or a neighboring cell. And we know that when a receptor is activated, um, it tells a cell to do something. And in the case of the brain, it's, it's usually a behavior that's elicited. So in the case of dopamine, the response typically is an experience of reward or pleasure. And in the case of norepinephrine, the response is generally stimulatory. Um, so that may help us focus or concentrate, for example. So when the signaling is complete, the neuron that released those chemicals, they actually use these transporters to recycle those chemicals back into the releasing cell. And that just allows for sustained signaling, okay? So that arrow is showing the uptake or the recycling of that dopamine and norepinephrine back into the cell. Okay, so how do prescription stimulants work? Well, they actually block these transporters and increase the extracellular levels of both dopamine and norepinephrine. So the top figure is what we just discussed, um, and now we've added um, the lower figure to show what happens when we add a prescription stimulant. So the prescription stimulant is actually now represented by the blue triangle, um, and you can see that it's bound to the reuptake or to that dopamine or norepinephrine transporter, and it essentially blocks or prevents the transport, um, the, the transporter from recycling that norepinephrine or dopamine. So notice that there's no arrow going through the transporter anymore, and that's because the drug has blocked the transporter. So what happens? Well, the dopamine and the norepinephrine, they actually have to stay outside the cell, um, and thus that allows for their extracellular levels to increase. And as a result, more dopamine, more norepinephrine is available um, to activate its receptor, and that just increases its overall effect, okay, or increases the cellular signaling through that receptor. And so a patient may actually experience that enhanced signaling um, as a form of cognitive en enhancement, okay? But again, because of where the target's expressed, specifically the norepinephrine transporter is also expressed at nerve terminals in the heart, a side effect of these drugs is also an increase in heart rate. Okay, so let's think about um, something for a minute here. We've just discussed how commonly misused prescription drugs work to elicit um, the pharmacological effects um, 
that we kind of mentioned at the beginning um, of the webinar. But as many of you are aware, um, these categories of drugs also can exhibit properties that facilitate dependency and addiction. So do you think the pharmacology of these drugs, the mechanisms that we just went over, could also facilitate their addictive properties? Okay, so this isn't a polling question. It's just something for you to think about. Um, and we're going to, in order to kind of discuss that, that question, um, this kind of brings us to a discussion of the brain's reward pathway. Okay, so first we have to think about, well, why are some drugs... Uh, misused or abused, and others are not, okay? So if you were to slice your brain straight down the center, you'd see an image fairly similar to the image on the right, okay? So in the center of our brain is a collection of cells or neurons that form the ventral tegmental area. So this is marked as area number one in the figure and labeled VTA. Okay, when these cells are activated, they release dopamine, that same chemical we just talked about, um, and they release dopamine into the nucleus accumbens, which is the second area marked in the figure. And what behavior did we say dopamine elicited in the brain? It was reward and pleasure, right? So when dopamine is released in the nucleus accumbens and it activates its receptor, the brain elicits feelings of pleasure and reward. The cells in the nucleus accumbens, um, because they're active, they then send signals to the prefrontal cortex. And what does our prefrontal cortex do? Well, it actually controls judgment and decision making. So the activation of that prefrontal cortex tells the brain, whatever you just did to elicit that pleasure and reward, that was a really good decision, okay? So our brain has found a way to link pleasure and reward to decision making. And there's natural stimulators of this pathway, okay? So if you just think about it for a minute, you might be wondering, well, what are those natural stimulators? And really, anything that could ensure survival of our species um, would be considered a natural stimulator of the pathway. So things like food, sex, these are all natural stimulators of this pathway. But this brings us to our first polling question. So... Could a drug modify the brain's reward pathway? Okay, so we want you to um, indicate your response. So if you believe the answer is A, yes, go ahead and indicate A. If you think it's B, no, indicate B. Or if you're not sure, um, indicate C. So we'll give you a minute to um, indicate your response and then we'll discuss the answer. Okay, so it looks like the poll has ended. We're just waiting on the results. Okay, so it looks like the majority of you answered A, yes. Um, a drug could modify the brain's reward pathway. And I agree, A is the correct answer. So we know drugs modify existing functions in the body or existing processes, and that's what the reward pathway is. It's an existing pathway um, in the brain and one that a drug could definitely modify. So let's talk about how drugs can modify the brain's reward pathway. Okay. So it's different for... Um, each type of drug or each category of drug, but through various mechanisms, a drug essentially, um, and, the, and this mechanism could be directly or indirectly, but it allows for the rapid and increased release of dopamine and the nucleus accumbens, that second area we marked in our reward pathway. So that rapid and increased release of dopamine in this area uh, that leads to that rapid activation of those dopamine receptors, an individual would experience um, an increased feeling of reward and pleasure, um, which is often described as euphoria or a euphoric high, okay? So in return, the activation of the nucleus accumbens 
activates the prefrontal cortex, tricking it into thinking, whatever you just did to elicit that pleasurable, rewarding feeling, you should do it again, okay? And this process kind of by definition encourages the individual to repeat or continue to take the drug. So let's do another quick polling question. Do you think all drugs can modify the reward pathway? So I'm referencing all prescription, uh, over-the-counter, illicit street drugs. Do you think they all can modify the reward pathway? So we wanna indicate A for yes, B for no, or C for I'm not sure. So go ahead and indicate your answer um, and then we'll discuss it. Okay, so it looks like the poll has ended, so we're just waiting on the results. Okay, so it looks like the majority of our participants um, indicated no, not all drugs modify the reward pathway, and that's correct. So if you think about it, not all drugs um, cause dependency or addiction, okay? So certainly not all drugs are gonna modify the reward pathway, um, but research has shown that all drugs with an addiction potential or all addictive drugs, um, they do modify this reward pathway. Now they might mediate dependency and addiction through other mechanisms, but they all share a common mechanism um, to modify this central uh, kind of reward pathway in the brain, okay? So if we look at the figure on the right, um, illicit street drugs like cocaine and heroin certainly can modify this pathway and either directly or indirectly release um, dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. But recreational drugs like nicotine and alcohol, they also modify the pathway through different mechanisms. And in addition, some prescription drugs um, can modify this pathway. And those prescription drugs that we know of are prescription drugs in those three categories of commonly misused prescription drugs. So the opioid pain relievers, stimulants, and sedatives. And so this suggests that the interaction of these prescription drugs with their respective target not only produces the pharmacological effects we discussed earlier, but it also um, either directly or indirectly modifies dopamine levels in the nucleus accumbens. And so this brings us to the final point that I wanted to make before we um, kind of summarize this first part of today's webinar. And that is that your brain doesn't care if society labels um, a drug as an illicit street drug or a prescription drug. Based on that fundamental principle of pharmacology we discussed earlier, if two chemicals are similar in shape and in their structure, they both can bind and activate the same target to elicit similar effects. So for example, take a look at the two chemical structures on this slide. Do you think that they look similar? Okay, so this is just something for you to think about by yourself. Um, and it doesn't really take a chemist to look at those structures and say, yeah, they look pretty similar, okay? So in fact, both chemicals activate the same receptor in the brain. So the chemical on the left is the prescription opioid pain reliever Oxycontin and the chemical on the right is heroin. Both drugs activate the mu opioid receptor to relieve pain, but they also activate the reward pathway um, to mediate um, increase in dopamine levels in the nucleus accumbens, okay? And so that's what mediates their addictive properties. And we'll actually discuss the relationship between Oxycontin and heroin um, a little bit later in the webinar. So in summary, we've discussed how the three categories of commonly misused prescription drugs work in the brain to elicit various pharmacological effects, um, including toxic or harmful effects um, like dependency and addiction. But other toxic effects include 
uh, respiratory depression, cardiac arrhythmias, again, based upon where the target is expressed in the body. Okay, and we'll actually talk a little bit about the mechanism that me mediates respiratory depression um, in a few slides. Okay, so let's discuss dependency, addiction, and withdrawal in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to define drug dependency as with repeated drug usage, the body functions normally only in the presence of the drug, such that removal of the drug leads to withdrawal. And then I'm defining drug addiction as the compulsive use of a drug, even if negative consequences ensue, and reward or pleasure no longer is the reason for the drug-seeking behavior. So one question that often arises is why does addiction occur? And it's a very, um, the answer is very complicated, it's very complex, but one, um, one factor is through activation of the reward pathway, which we've already discussed, okay? But how does addiction occur? And that, that's actually even more complicated. And so research has shown that long lasting neuronal changes through adaptations um, and an individual's brain um, might kind of mediate how addiction occurs. Okay, so let's talk about some of those adaptations. So this is just a sampling of adaptations um, that may contribute to an addicted state. So one ad adaptation is drug targets adapt. So that might mean that receptor number in the brain may increase or decrease. There might be changes in gene expression, and there could be loss or gain of neuronal connections. So maybe there's um, loss of neurons in general, or just the connectivity between different cells in the brain changes. So one question that um, is kind of interesting to think about is could these adaptations affect a drug's response? Okay, so we're actually gonna review an excerpt from the documentary Oxycontin Express, and we can't watch this documentary during the webinar, um, but here is a link if you're interested in viewing it once the webinar concludes on your own time. And again, this excerpt that we're gonna walk through, it's going to help us answer the question, could these brain adaptations, specifically the first one, drug targets adapting, how do they affect a drug's response? So if you, if you end up watching the documentary, it's about 14 minutes into the documentary, um, the scene is a gentleman, his name is Todd, and he is addicted to prescription opioids. So he has just finished misusing um, Oxycontin when the following dialogue takes place. So the journalist interviewing him says, how do you feel now? And this is Todd's response. I feel normal. I don't feel high. I just feel normal. I feel like I did if I didn't use drugs. See, when you do drugs, you go up and you go down. And after a while, you start to go below the normal level. So when you get high, you're just getting normal again. You're not getting high anymore. Do you see what I'm saying? So let's see if we understand what Todd is saying. All right, so here's our next polling question. So which biological mechanism, mechanism supports Todd's explanation of just getting normal? Okay, so do you think the number of dopamine receptors in the reward pathway has A, remain unchanged, B, increased, or C, decreased? So remember, it was the release of do dopamine in the reward pathway and activation of its receptor that was mediating um, that rewarding or pleasurable feeling. So go ahead and indicate your response, um, and then we'll discuss the answer. Okay, so the poll has ended and we'll just wait for the results.
Okay, so it looks like we're kind of split 50-50 between um, an increase or a decrease. So I'll just tell you the answer is actually a decrease. Uh, so C is the correct answer, but let's kind of talk through this because it is kind of a complex uh, concept to think about. So the reason why there are fewer dopamine receptors expressed in the reward pathway and in Todd's brain is that those dopamine receptors have adapted to being chronically stimulated, okay? So for example, if we look in the figure on the right, it displays three panels. The top panel is showing just the normal number of dopamine receptors expressed in the reward pathway. So this might be the state in someone that is not um, addicted to prescription opioids. However, upon continuing to misuse prescription um, or that Oxycontin, recall that there's kind of sustained release of dopamine and the reward pathway and thus continued activation of dopamine receptors, okay? So Todd's body is saying this continued persistent activation of these dopamine receptors, this is not normal, okay? And the body always wants to maintain homeostasis. It's always trying to get back to normal. And so the uh, Todd's brain um, is going to try to return things to normal, that is before the presence of the drug, by actually reducing that excessive activation of the dopamine receptor. And so it does this by decreasing receptor number, okay? And so actually, if you look at the brain of individuals addicted to various drugs, so heroin, cocaine, meth, they all would show a decrease in dopamine receptor number in the nucleus accumbens. Okay, so this is a consistent kind of phenomenon um, with drugs that activate the reward pathway. So if we go back to the excerpt, I'm just gonna go back a couple slides. You can see when Todd says, when you do drugs, you go up and you go down, he's saying, you know, when we, when maybe he first started um, misusing that Oxycontin, he did experience that euphoric high because dopamine was activating that dopamine receptor. Um, but after a while, you start to go below the normal level. So he's going below the normal level because there's just not enough dopamine receptors in his reward pathway um, to elicit that same effect, okay? And so what this mediates is a process known as um, tolerance, okay? So one adaptation of the brain is dopamine receptor number decreases, okay, because the body's trying to adapt to its consistent stimulation, and that just contributes to drug tolerance, okay. So recall with drug dependence, the body um, adapted to the presence of the drug, and thus removal of the drug led to a state of withdrawal. So the decre decrease in dopamine receptor number, that's just one adaptation that the brain is working through, okay? The brain is also adapting to the continued presence of that Oxycontin by um, maybe changing the number of other receptors expressed. Maybe it's changing the expression of different genes. Maybe it's changing the connection between cells. Um, so upon the absence of the drug, upon the absence of the Oxycontin, all of those adaptations have essentially changed the way the brain is functioning. Um, and all of those adaptations can contribute to those symptoms um, of withdrawal. And that's a very kind of surface level explanation of the concept, but hopefully gives you a little bit better understanding of what um, the state of the addicted brain is. Okay, so to summarize, why does addiction occur one mechanism is through activation of the reward pathway. How does it occur? We know that long-lasting neuronal changes certainly contributes um, to addiction. And this kind of brings the question, well, are there factors that might increase the addiction potential of a drug? Okay, so let's discuss a couple of factors that might increase a drug's addiction potential. So this slide is actually showing us risk factors for addiction. And this is a highly researched area, but we know that some risk factors for addiction um, may be considered environmental. They, they may be considered biological in nature, such as genetic risk factors. But the drug itself um, may convey its kind of own set of risk factors. So for example, 
The route of drug administration has the ability to increase the addiction potential of a drug. And so that's what we're going to just focus on um, today is kind of explaining how the route of drug administration may increase the addiction potential of a drug. Okay, so we have another polling question. So which route of administration allows the drug to reach the brain the fastest? Okay, so if you think A, snorting, is it B, intravenous injection, C, oral, so this is just the act of swallowing a pill, or D, inhalation? Which of those routes would allow a drug to reach the brain the fastest? So go ahead and indicate your answer. Okay, so it looks like the poll has ended. So we'll just wait for the results to um, be displayed. Okay, so it looks like major or about half of our participants, or almost half, uh, indicated B, intravenous injection, with inhalation coming in as a close second. Okay, so to kind of discuss the answer to this question, uh, let's advance the slide here. Let's discuss this diagram. So if you actually download these slides um, on your computer following the webinar, this diagram or this figure would actually animate. And so what it's showing are four different routes of administration, the four routes that we just indicated in our polling question. And the circles, those are actually supposed to represent drug molecules entering um, the point in the body based upon what, what was the route of administration. And it would animate to show you the path those drug molecules take to reach the brain. Okay, so let's just walk through this. So if you administer a drug orally, that is you swallow a pill, this is actually the slowest route to the brain. And why is it the slowest? Well, it actually has to take or, or go through the most obstacles. So it actually enters the stomach, it has to move through the intestines, and moves through the liver. And if you follow the arrows and you kind of look at the left side of the figure, you can see that after the liver, the drug molecules would enter the veins and then they move up to the heart where they would enter the right side of the heart and then the lungs and then the left side of the heart. And then they would enter the arteries. Okay, now we're on the right side of the figure and the arteries would deliver the drug to the brain. So that's actually the longest path a drug um, could take to the brain. Now, if you think about intravenous injection or snorting, when a drug is delivered through those two routes, it actually enters right into the veins, okay? So we kind of bypass the stomach and the liver. It enters right into the veins, but it still has to move into the right side of the heart, through the lungs, and to the left side of the heart. Then it enters the arteries, and then it's delivered to the brain. So inhalation is actually the fastest route of delivery um, to get a drug to the brain. And that's because it bypasses the right side of the heart. So when we inhale a drug, it enters our lungs and it goes right into the left side of the heart and enters into the arteries and delivers the drug to the brain. Okay, so that's why just the act of, for example, smoking a cigarette, um, it can be very addicting um, because of the route of administration is inhalation. So the correct answer to our polling question was D, inhalation. So overall, the route of administration, it affects the rate that the drug reaches the brain, and this increases the addiction potential of the drug. So this explains why some individuals manipulate the route of administration of prescription drugs like prescription opioids, okay? So they're trying to rapidly deliver the drug to the brain in order to rapidly release dopamine and the brain's reward pathway, rapidly activate those dopamine receptors and elicit that euphoric high. Okay, so this is how the route of administration can increase the addiction potential of a drug. But are there concerns with manipulating a drug's route of administration? So 
to think about this question, let's establish some context. And we have an example here with Oxycontin. So if Oxycontin, that's a prescription pain reliever, and prescription pain relievers were developed to treat chronic pain. And so some drugs were formulated in a way to release that medication over a period of time. So for example, Oxycontin can be formulated um, as an extended release product. So if you take a look at the graph on the y-axis um, is Oxycodone or, or Oxycontin blood levels and time is graphed on the x-axis. Now the, the lines actually represent different doses, okay, but they all show the same kind of concept. So if you notice for each graph, when the patient takes a pill at time zero, the blood levels increase, and that demonstrates that the drug's entering systemic circulation. And notice that the levels stay fairly constant over the next 12 hours, and that's just because the pill is gradually releasing um, the medication over the period um, of 12 hours, okay? And that's allowing for continuous pain relief. Now, if you crush this pill to maybe inject it, inhale it, or snort it, so you're manipulating the route of administration, you actually then destroy those extended release properties. And so how does that change the drug's response? Well, it actually enhances the drug's response because now the dose intended to be released over 12 hours is released now all at the same time, okay? And so not only does that enhance the drug's response, but it certainly increases the risk um, for toxicity. So for example, the location of the, the target for prescription opioids, that mu opioid the mu opioid receptor, it's certainly expressed in parts of the body that control pain as well as in the reward pathway. But the figure here on the right is showing um, some other areas that it's expressed. And if you look closely at the top panel, that green arrow is pointing to the brainstem, okay? So the brainstem actually regulates breathing. So at high doses observed in a drug overdose situation, the activation of those mu opioid receptors in the brainstem can actually cause respiratory depression and arrest breathing, all right? And so this is often the mechanism of death um, mediated by an opioid drug overdose. So in thinking of prescription opioids, we know that it's pharmacology is full activation of the mu opioid receptor. Again, in pharmacology, we refer that mechanism as um, pr the prescription opioid is behaving as a full agonist. We know that some individuals manipulate the drug's formulation um, to facilitate rapid delivery of the drug to the brain so through mechanisms of intravenous injection, snorting, or inhaling. And we know that drug overdoses on prescription opioids can suppress and possibly um, arrest breathing. So this brings us to the point in the webinar where we can start to think about, you know, what approaches are available to treat opioid dependency and addiction. So we're going to discuss um, a couple of those approaches at this point. So as a scientist, um, the scientific community views addiction as a disease. And as such, many diseases are treated with both pharmacological and non-pharmacological approaches. Um, that's certainly the case for addiction. But we're just going to focus on discussing one type of um, a pharmacological approach, okay? So with addiction, one treatment goal would be to reduce the individual's craving for the drug, to alleviate withdrawal, and to prevent relapse. So if we look at the graph at the bottom of this slide, the percent response is graphed on the y-axis. And just for this hypothetical example, we'll define what 100% response as a euphoric high, okay? And we'll define 0% response as um, a feeling of a craving for the drug or maybe even um, feeling withdrawal symptoms. So in this example, we're gonna assume this green bar reflects an individual addicted to opioids um, experience a 100% response um, upon using um, opioids. Okay, so we're gonna discuss three pharmacological approaches to treating um, 
opioid addiction and, and to kind of think through which one might be the most advantageous. So the first available approach is to administer a medication that mimics the abused drug's effect. So methadone is an example of this approach. Methadone, um, like Oxycontin, for example, fully activates the mu opioid receptor. And if we graph its hypothetical response on our chart, it likely could elicit similar effects to the abused drug because its pharmacology, again, mimics it, okay? So it's a full agonist. It fully activates that mu opioid receptor. So if we think about it, it if we think about our treatment goal, it, it certainly would reduce cravings and kind of prevent withdrawal symptoms because it's, it's fully activating the same receptor as heroin or, or Oxycontin, but it has significant abuse potential because of that mechanism, okay? So that is kind of the downside um, to this type of approach. So let's think about a second approach. The second approach would be to just block the effect of the abused drug. And that's actually what naloxone does. So naloxone, as in, in pharmacology, we would consider naloxone an antagonist, okay? So it binds the mu opioid receptor, but it actually inactivates the receptor. And thereby, it would prevent its activation or response um, mediated by any type of opioid drug or even the norepeptide, the natural chemical our body makes, okay? So it's essentially the opposite of approach number one. So if we look on our chart, blocking the effect of um, the abused drug certainly eliminates any abuse potential, right? Because it's not activating the receptor, so there's probably no potential for abuse with naloxone. But again, it, it's not going to allow for any activation of that mu opioid receptor. And so this often can contribute to a sensation or feeling of a craving for the abused drug or even um, withdrawal-like symptoms. Okay, so that's kind of the downside to this approach. So let's see if our third approach maybe could meet uh, somewhere in the middle. So our third approach is to partially substitute the effect of the abused drug. So buprenorphine is our example here. And again, from a pharmacological perspective, we would describe buprenorphine as what we call a partial agonist, okay? So it partially activates the mu opioid receptor, and this partial activation is enough to often alleviate cravings and withdrawal symptoms, but because it doesn't fully activate the receptor, like Oxycontin or heroin, um, it doesn't often, or it typically does not produce a euphoric high, and so there's a minimal abuse potential with the approach, okay? So many might view approach number three as the most advantageous pharmacological approach um, for treating opioid addiction. So in thinking about treating opioid addiction and thinking about what we know about a drug's route of administration, um, how could you formulate buprenorphine to further deter misuse? So would you recommend delivering it as A, a pill, B, an IV injection, C, an aerosol spray, so that's something that you might inhale, or D, a sublingual film, which is a film placed under the tongue? So go ahead and indicate your answer, and then we'll discuss. Okay, so it looks like the poll has ended, so we'll just wait for the results to be revealed. Okay, so there's kind of a varied response. It looks like we had almost equal number of participants indicate um, either to deliver buprenorphine as a pill or as a sibling you will film. So 
D is actually probably the best option to deter misuse. So if you think about a pill, that could easily be crushed um, and thereby an individual could snort or inject. And even though it has partial agonist properties, um, it could still facilitate misuse. And so D, a sublingual film, is actually kind of the, the best delivery route to further deter misuse. So let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. So buprenorphine um, is actually often administered as part of a combination therapy marketed as Suboxone. Um, and the other drug in the therapy is naloxone. So we kind of already mentioned naloxone. We said that it was a drug that blocked the mu opioid receptor. Um, so you may be wondering, well, why is buprenorphine administered with naloxone and not just by itself? Well, it turns out if a patient prescribes Suboxone, takes the medication as instructed, um, so they administer the drug as the sublingual film, again, one option for delivering the drug, and they place it under the tongue. This route will only allow for the buprenorphine medication to be active, okay? So just because of the properties um, of naloxone, when naloxone is administered through this form, it's actually inactive. And so as a result, the patient will only experience that desired response from the buprenorphine. However, if a patient attempts to manipulate this route of suboxone administration, even though it's delivered as a sub sublingual film, if they attempt to manipulate it, and let's say they inject it intravenously, when they administer the suboxone through this route of administration, all of a sudden now the naloxone medication becomes active and the response the patient experiences will be the response from the naloxone. And so again, because naloxone blocks the mu opioid receptor in that situation, it would likely produce withdrawal-like symptoms and that would certainly be undesirable for the patient. Okay, so the addition of naloxone as well as the delivering um, the medication as a sublingual film both kind of help deter um, the misuse of buprenorphine. So in summary, to, to treat opioid addiction, one pharmacological approach is suboxone combination therapy. It balances treatment with deterring misuse um, by being formulated as a sublingual film and containing two medications. Again, the buprenorphine um, mediates the medication's response when used as instructed, allowing the relief of cravings and withdrawal. Um, but if misused, the medication's response will be mediated by naloxone and the patient will experience undesirable withdrawal-like symptoms. And so we can actually apply similar pharmacological principles to understand approaches um, to rescue an opioid overdose. So let's quickly talk about this. So this is our last polling question. What if you wanted to reverse an opioid overdose? You would administer A or AN, A, a full agonist like methadone that fully activated the mu opioid receptor, B, the partial agonist buprenorphine that we just discussed, or C, an antagonist like naloxone that blocked the effect um, of the abused drug at the mu opioid receptor. So go ahead and indicate your answer and then we'll discuss. Okay, so it looks like the poll has ended, so we're just waiting for the results. Okay, so excellent. The majority of our participants uh, think that in this case, you'd want to administer an antagonist like naloxone to reverse an opioid overdose, and I agree. So let's talk about why. So this figure depicts why naloxone can rescue an opioid overdose. And we've seen a similar figure earlier in the webinar. Um, so let's focus on the top panel. So the purple receptor is still that mu opioid receptor, um, but now the blue shape is heroin or our prescription opioid. 
And in an overdose situation, these drugs are activating the receptor. And recall one potential consequence from that activation could be respiratory depression, which can eventually cause death. Okay. So let's pretend the naloxone now is the red shape. Naloxone, by definition, is an antagonist. And what that means is when it's administered, it actually has the ability to knock off the heroin or the prescription opioid bound to that mu opioid receptor, much like it's what it's doing in this figure. And as a result, it stops or it prevents activation of the receptor, which is what's causing the respiratory depression. Okay. So what response or what's the consequence of that? Well, it essentially rescues or helps to restore breathing. And that's how naloxone can function to rescue an opioid overdose. So if you're interested in visualizing this process, I encourage you to watch this YouTube video where Dr. Sanjay Gupta explains how naloxone works to rescue an opioid overdose. Um, and it actually features an individual administering naloxone to someone that's overdosed um, on opioids. Individual come back to life um, after administration of naloxone. So that's kind of an interesting video to, to watch on your own time if you're interested in this topic. So in summary, naloxone rescues opioid overdoses um, due to its pharmacology. Again, it acts as an antagonist. It can block the effect of the abused drug. The FDA approved delivery method is an intramuscular injection. Um, but adaptation of this injectable form for use as an intranasal spray is currently being evaluated by the FDA. And there are two, or there are several, but, but two main precautions regarding naloxone that is important to be aware of. First, because of its pharmacology, it will precipitate withdrawal-like symptoms in the individual. And so that's important for the individual administering the drug to be aware of. But second, it's only effective with opioid overdoses. Again, only... That's because it only blocks the opioid uh, receptor. So if the overdose is due to a non-opioid drug, um, it will have no effect and it will not rescue breathing. And if you're interested in learning more about naloxone, um, perhaps finding a distribution program in your community or just additional information on how to administer it, I encourage you to visit generationrx.org. If you go to the Learn tab and then in the section Helping Others, you can find uh, more information about naloxone. Okay, so we kind of reached the end of the webinar, and I just want to kind of touch on a few points before we conclude. So the first point is to know that scientists are trying to identify a approaches for treating chronic pain um, while deterring misuse. And in fact, a recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine kind of summarized these approaches, as well as the CDC recently released um, new opioid prescribing guidelines. And so if you're interested in um, this area, I encourage you to uh, consult these resources. Some of the approaches are summarized in this box, and we've um, kind of discussed actually a few of the approaches. Um, but there are discussions around how to best treat chronic pain while deterring misuse. And in fact, other conversations are occurring to discuss if negative, if there are negative aspects um, to these efforts. Okay, so are there negative aspects to treating chronic pain while deterring uh, misuse? And as many of you are likely aware, there's been a surge of heroin use in the United States in recent years. And the graph on this slide displays the number of overdose deaths from prescription opioids in blue and from heroin in red over time. Um, and there's been much conversation around trying to understand the factors um, that mediate the rise in overdose deaths from heroin um, over the last few years. And so some factors discussed certainly include the price and the accessibility of heroin. Um, and while it's not the sole factor, the reformulation of prescription opioids, along with policy efforts to limit their supply, likely does account for a small proportion um, of this total heroin problem. And one um, kind of troubling trend that we're observing is that since 2008, as you can see here at this figure, there's been a rise in the concurrent use of both heroin and prescription opioids. So, if you recall from the first part of the webinar, uh, we discussed the chemical similarities and the identical pharmacology between these two drugs. 
And so as, an, as a result, an individual dependent or addicted to prescription opioids can easily transition to heroin because of their similar pharmacology and because they elicit similar effects in the body. So there, this relationship um, between prescription opioids and heroin is certainly troubling um, and one that scientists and healthcare professionals are trying to better understand. So in summary, the pharmacology of commonly misused prescription drugs often facilitates uh, their misuse and, and addictive properties. Um, we are making advances toward treating opioid addiction, rescuing opioid overdoses, and treating chronic pain while deterring misuse. But we still are, are discussing how do we continue these efforts while minimizing unanticipated negative effects. So if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to visit generationrx.org or the Higher Education Center's website. And at this point, we're happy to take questions now, or if you need to go, feel free to write down my email address and email me, and I'll be happy to answer your questions via email. Thank you, Dr. Downing. Uh, fabulous job. I, I have the pleasure of working uh, with Molly with students at the College of Pharmacy. Students love Dr. Downing, and maybe you can you can see why from this presentation she's just given us. We've run out of time, uh, Dr. Downing, but what I'd like to do is uh, just quickly, maybe we can address two quick questions uh, that we've received. One is that the graph that you showed uh, showing the time for drugs to reach the brain seems to show that IV is faster. So the, there was some confusion expressed there. Can you briefly kind of help us understand again uh, why inhalation is actually a faster route? Yeah, so this graph, this graph can be confusing. We actually, um, some students can be confused by it. So it's, it's kind of being specific more to cocaine. Um, and if you look, it's kind of showing you the high. So this is just showing you the response on the y-axis here. And so it's showing that smoking a drug through inhalation or intravenous administration may elicit a similar high or similar euphoric effect. Um, it's not really indicating how quickly the drug gets to the brain. So just biologically speaking, you know, inhalation is the fastest route to the brain, um, but it can elicit similar highs or similar feelings um, through both routes. I don't know. Hopefully that answered yeah, your question. That's a great answer. Um, the, 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 the second and last question we'll address is this one. You noted a clinical response for prescription stimulants as cognitive enhancement or increased attention. Does this mean that drugs like Adderall enhance learning? Do we have evidence that students who misuse these drugs have better grades? So if I'm recalling my research correctly, I think the research would actually show the opposite. And, and Dr. Hale, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's actually some research that shows students that misuse prescription stimulants, so they are not prescribed that drug um, to because they, they have not been diagnosed with ADD or ADHD, so they're misusing those stimulants. It seems that research has shown they actually perform worse on um, kind of academic assessments. Is, is that your understanding, Dr. Hale? Yeah, absolutely. Uh we, and, and we've done some work here at Ohio State, as you know, Molly, that shows that uh, students who admit misusing prescription stimulants, drugs like Adderall, for example, uh, there's a reverse correlation or inverse correlation with GPA. Um, Dr. Amelia Aria, who's done a lot of work around this topic at the University of Maryland, has had similar results. So we know that uh, students who do misuse these drugs in this way do not typically perform better academically. Uh, and there are a lot of other kind of uh, peripheral maybe reasons for that. For example, Dr. Aria has shown you know, these students tend to miss class more often. You know, they procrastinate on assignments and all those sorts of things. So um, I think one of the biggest myths we have to bust on campus perhaps is that these drugs are so-called study drugs. So uh, uh, we really hope that Dr. Downing's presentation has expanded your understanding of the pharmacology of commonly misused prescription drugs. Uh, you will soon receive an email message with links to today's slides and a recording of this webinar. Please keep in touch with the Higher Education Center via email, social media, and through our website. We hope that you will join us for future webinars and check out our free podcast series as well. These are all posted to our website. We would also like to invite you to our second national meeting, which will be held August 2nd through the 4th at the Blackwell Inn on Ohio State's campus.
you can register for this conference via our website. The theme for this year is Gearing Up for Change. Uh, some of the presentation topics include town gown partnerships, social host laws, marijuana and student athletes, collegiate recovery, environmental prevention, individual and campus resiliency, stigma reduction, and much more. And just a few examples of the uh, speakers that have been lined up, and there are many, but these include Sam Canyonas, author of Dreamland or uh, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic. Uh, and also Dr. Ralph Hingson from NIAAA. We have uh, representatives from the Association of Recovery and Higher Education, NCAA, and many others. So thank you for joining us and for all you do to provide prevention and recovery services for one of our most precious national resources, our college students. This concludes today's webinar.